Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think it's uh, fortuitous that Jonathan Durham is going to um, be in a position to speak here because I suspect he's going to have some very interesting things to say. Now, what I'm going to do in this paper, in the relatively short time that I have, is to give you an outline of, of the issue of the transposition of the Environmental Liability Directive in Ireland. Um, uh, you, we've had already heard from the Minister in relation to this, and he made the point that transposition of the Environmental Liability Directive um, is actually quite difficult uh, and has proved a lengthy enough process. And that's normally uh, you know, a source for criticism. But in fact, uh, in a common law jurisdiction, and there's been similar difficulties in England, the nature of the uh, Environmental Liability Directive is such that um, it was always going to ca cause complex, uh, com uh, some difficulties. So we've had an extended consultation process. What we have is the Environmental Liability Regulations 2008, which were published in December. I'm going to discuss those in some detail. And we also have a draft Environmental Liability Bill 2008, which I'm also going to discuss. Um, the situation at the moment is the regulations are operative. They've been operative as and from the 1st of April. And the position with the bill, as you heard the Minister say, is it's still pending. I think there's suggestions it may be uh, enacted uh, within the next... Um, certainly a month or so, or perhaps sooner than that. Now, the draft environmental liability uh, bill obviously comes with a health warning because it is only, in fact, the draft heads of a bill which was published as past, uh, a part of the consultation process in 2008. It's not actually a draft bill, per se. It's only the, uh, the, the heads of a bill. But um, uh, it doesn't seem the uh, adoption of uh, or the transposition of the directive in Ireland is going to be done uh, by way of the regulations. Uh, so therefore the bill is really peripheral. It's not the principal in instrument of transposition. The reason why is that um, the, the directive itself, as we'll discuss in more details, allows member states the option to uh, implement certainly discretionary elements. And the advice was given to Ireland that, um, from the AG, I think, that it wasn't possible to adopt these discretionary elements by way of a secondary instrument, so therefore it was necessary to do so in a primary legislation, and that seems to be the sole purpose of the bill. Um, as we say, it looks as if that bill will be produced relatively soon. Now, so what I'm talking when I'm making re reference to this, I'm simply talking about the drafts, heads of the bill as published, uh, and one assumes that there won't be much uh, more or additional um, uh, provisions in the actual draft bill when it comes forward. As you said, the primary purpose of the bill is simply to adopt a number of discretionary elements of the Environmental Liability Directive. Uh, obviously, when it's enacted, it will be necessary to, be, to view the system, uh, 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 the law effectively, as, as both the bill and the regulations, with the bulk of the substantive pr uh, pr provisions contained within the uh, regulations, but with some cross-referencing as between the two. Now, in terms of the discretionary elements, what's proposed at the moment is to adopt uh, the extension of the discretion to member states to extend the habitats and species protection, which is an option. More significantly, perhaps, is to uh, also adopt the permit and state-of-the-art defence. They're within the Environmental Liability Directive. They're discretionary for member states to effectively adopt or introduce what's known as a permit or state-of-the-art defence, and we'll perhaps discuss those later. Um, there's also also, uh, uh, effectively, a discretion for member states to introduce uh, 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 an exemption or a curtailment of the provisions in, re in respect of requests for action in, re in, in respect of imminent threats of environmental damage. And our, at the moment, the proposal is that we will, we will go down that route in Ireland. And there's also an adoption of, of certain discretionary provisions in relation to the scheduled activities. And we're also proposing to adopt that. I should say that's gone into in more detail uh, in the uh, written paper where I explain in detail what that is. And there's also a suggestion that the current schedule of the environmental liability um, regulations will in fact be amended when the Act is uh, enacted by a new uh, schedule which is slightly broader in ambit. And I don't propose to, to talk about that too much because there is uh, really always the possibility that it will change. Um, the environmental liability directions are now law and they are now operative and they are by the, the essential components by which we've transposed the environmental liability directive. Um, 
they very closely mirror the scheme of the directive. Uh, there's nothing particularly radical or innovative within them, uh, and they will obviously, as you say, interact with the bill in, in situ. So what you have is a fairly complicated system of environmental liability. Now, what this is, is effectively, uh, in very simple terms, what the regulations have done is they have created a new layer of environmental liability over the existing legislation that exists. So there's a blanket of existing legislation, waste management legislation, uh, le legislation relating to integrated pollution control, uh, water, air pollution, etc. All of that is there, all of that has provisions in respect of liability. Uh, that remains in situ, it's not revoked by this particular legislation. But the environmental li liability regulation places a layer of environmental um, liability and obligations over all of that and there's an interaction as between the two. Um, the regulations are fairly wide in scope as a result. They apply to basically environmental damage or imminent threat of environmental damage caused by occupational activity referred to in Schedule 3, which I'll discuss in a moment. And they also apply to damage to protected species, natural habitats, or imminent threat of that damage, where the operator or occupational activity, other than certain activities referred to in Schedule 3, acts or fails to act. And he knows, or ought to have known, that his or her act or failure to act causes or would cause damage or imminent threat to damage to protected species and natural um, habitats. So that's essentially the core element of the regulations. Now, in order to... Uh, uh, to understand that, you also have a number of definitions which are critical to the operation of the regulations. Firstly, there's the definition of environmental damage, which is defined as damage to protected species, natural habitats, water damage, or land damage. These, in turn, are subdefined uh, in the regulations as you have protected, and you also have definitions of protected species, and you also have a definition of an operators. Um, there's nothing radical about these uh, definitions. I think they very closely mirror the definitions contained within the environmental liability directive itself. There's nothing particularly new in relation to that. Uh, there are some issues perhaps which we might discuss, I know Aoife might discuss, uh, which is um, in, in terms of definitions which aren't within the regulations. For example, there's no definition of what land is, etc. And that may give rise to some issues. Just to be qu clear and uh, quickly, that slide, uh, there are certain exemptions also to the Environmental Liability Directive in terms of armed conflict and natural phenomena, uh, acts of God. I think the most significant of those is Article 4.5, which makes the point where environmental damage uh, or imminent threat to such damage is caused by pollution of a diffuse character. Uh, I presume that's to distinguish between pollution from a point source, which uh, is always more, more easy to deal with, both uh, legally and in, terms, uh, in technical terms, but where it's from a of a diffuse character, the regulations do not apply unless it is possible to establish a causal link between the damage uh, uh, and the activities of the uh, operator. That is an interesting provision and is obviously a provision which is going to be, uh, give rise possibly to some issues going forward. Um, and it's probably the most important uh, uh, provision in terms of the exemptions. Now, I think it's useful to distinguish, as the regulations do, between two scenarios, which is effectively the core of this scheme. First of all, you have a scenario where there's an imminent threat of environmental damage. And if you have this scenario, the regulations impose certain obligations. Uh, the core obligation is where you have a scenario where there's an imminent threat of environmental damage um, and you as an operator of an occupational activity and the terms operator and occupational activity are broadly defined. You can look up the definitions yourself in the paper but for all purposes they encompass a lot. If you're aware or you ought reasonably be expected in the circumstances to form an opinion that there is an imminent threat that it will occur, you, he or she, or you, is, shall without delay take necessary preventative measures. Now that's an important provision and that's one of the most significant elements of the uh, regulations and in fact that's one of the most significant new uh, liabilities imposed by the regulations because to a certain degree that, there's, there isn't really equivalent provisions like that. This is what, uh, as I say to you, it's a mandatory obligation. Okay, so There's no, no discretion here and the requirement is to take without delay take immediate necessary preventative measures without going any further. So if you have a scenario on, in, in a factory, you have a leak or whatever it is, the requirement under the regulations, if you're within the scope of the regulations, the requirement is that you take immediate um, action. And these uh, 
this obligation is also significantly what I've termed self-executing. In other words, it triggers automatically as a matter of law. There's no going to the EPA, there's no going to local authorities to discuss it. In fact, there's no going anywhere. You're supposed to be aware of it and you're supposed to take acts uh, as steps immediately. And the failure to do so is an offence, and we'll discuss that later on. And in these circumstances, in that scenario as well, the other thing the regulations do is they impose uh, obligations on the EPA to issue a direction. But that's an important provision, and I think that, that uh, clients who, have, who are p potentially susceptible to this type of uh, liability should be made aware by the legal advisors of this provision. I think that's important that they should be made aware because it would not be a defence to say we didn't know we had that obligation. I think that's probably one of the most significant changes introduced by the regulations and the new regime it would be my view. Um, if we go on to the next scenario, the next scenario is possibly less radical. Uh, where environmental damage has occurred, in other words, where it actually has occurred, well the obligation imposed by the regulation is uh, the person who is aware or ought reasonably aware um, is required to inform the EPA without delay and then you're also obliged to take all practical steps to immediately control um, um, uh, the, the damage and as I say um, that second obligation is kind of fleshed out. That's not as radical an innovation in my view because in any event many of the activities would be subject to similar obligations in for example an IPPC license. So in any event you'd be under a, a, an existing legal obligation to do that. So immediately for example if an incident occurs it would be a, a, a condition of your IPC license to immediately notify the Environmental Protection Agency and to immediately uh, to obviously take steps. It has to be said of course that in both these obligations one would assume that any responsible uh, commercial operation or indeed any responsible individual will be, ta will be taking these measures in any event but I presume the significance is, is that these are now legal, legally uh, binding measures. Um, so I think that's less radical. Um, then the, the, where the damage has occurred, the EPA is required to issue a direction. And I think I, I'm not going to go through this quite quickly because Jonathan Durham will, I think, have more interesting things to say about how they're going to, to deal with that. Um, the requirement is effectively that they must issue a direction. In other words, it require you to take certain steps. Again, there's nothing perhaps hugely radical about that because in any event, the EPA would have that power in many cases in terms of most operators because they would be subject to existing licenses and they would have those powers under their existing legislation in any event. Now, the determination of re remedial measures is a matter for the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, but the interesting thing here, and what's new about this, is that the regulations make a specific provision for allowing not just the operator, in other words the person who is running the factory or running the plant, but also to allow uh, persons with sufficient interest in the decision and environmental NGOs in certain circumstances to have a say in what those remedial uh, measure, measures should be. And I think that's a highly significant development uh, and a, a kind of a, a, a very significant change because as a matter of law generally there is no role for third parties in terms of and no formalised or legal role for third parties in terms of permitting them to have a say in what remedial measures should be imposed by the licensing authority. Um, now if you're a party to a court action, uh, you may well be in a position to uh, make arguments before the court um, and be permitted, generally you will be permitted to make arguments before the court as to what measures should be taken. But uh, this goes somewhat further than that, in that it actually enshrines that as a statutory right, and that's one of the most significant changes, I think, in the, in the, um, in the regulations. Uh, how that will operate in practice um, is going to be quite interesting. As I say, Jonathan may have, have, have uh, uh, pr uh, things to say in relation to that. Uh, just to note, the EPA obviously then, uh, it, it, when it's making its decision in terms of remedial measures, it has to have regard to what's known as a framework of remedial measures set out in the, the Schedule 2 to the regulations, which is effectively uh, um, replicating what's in the directive. The, there's a requirement that they issue the notification uh, of the proposed remedial measures and there is a right of appeal to the district court uh, from the operator. So you do have a right of appeal uh, if you say that, well, what they're suggesting is a Rolls-Royce solution, whereas if we say that a kind of a, I don't know, a, a kind of a Skoda solution or a Fiat solution may be, may be the, the answer. Now the other big change, I think, in these regulations is they introduce what is an entirely new concept into Irish law. And that's, they introduce a statutory right to 
give a request for action, what's termed. In other words, they give uh, environmental NGOs or designated persons, which I'll talk about in more minutes, the right to request formally as a matter of law that uh, the EPA, in this case, take certain actions to do its, or to exercise its statutory functions. Now, one of the questions that I most frequently get asked, I think, in practice is, can you compel uh, a planning authority, for example, to take planning enforcement proceedings? Or can you compel, this obviously is before this, can you compel a local authority to take environmental proceedings? And the answer is generally no. Okay? You cannot, there's no mandatory obligation on local authorities. It's a matter for their discretion. Now, there's a small exception there, I presume, in the Planning and Development Act, where there's a requirement for them to take a complaint seriously and uh, issue a warning letter. But apart from that, there, there is no requirement. And this is radical in that it, it actually puts a, a new concept into Irish law whereby uh, certain environmental NGOs will have the right to, re to introduce a request for action. And the persons who, who may lodge such a request are persons who, and this is what the regulations say and which is significant, are affected or likely to be affected by the incident of environmental damage and one assumes that would be local residents or people living in the vicinity, um, and B or B have a sufficient interest in the decision relating to the environment made by the EPA or any other person. So I think that's quite a wide range of individuals who would have the right to bring forward a request for action. So I think that's one of the most significant changes. And in fact, a number of the environmental NGOs have already sent in requests for action. I certainly know one uh, which was sent in last summer. I don't know, and Jonathan may be able to illuminate whether there's going to be an awful lot more, whether they've received a, a number of requests for action immediately. But that, as I think, is, is a very radical change introduced by the uh, regulations. In terms of sufficient interest, um, the sufficient interest is defined as a person who can satisfy the EPA that he or she is a member of an organisation that promotes the protection of the environment and has acted to promote the protection of the environment during the period of 12 months prior to the request. Um, I think that's probably to cover people um, who would create, for example, environmental NGO, NGOs overnight or something like that scenario. Um, and then the request also must be accompanied by a report which uh, contains data and information relevant to the environmental damage. Um, when the EPA re um, receives that request for action, it triggers certain requirements. And again, there's a statutory requirement to the consider the request. Um, there's also going to be a provision in the bill that they'll um, uh, be entitled to dismiss it if they consider it to be frivolous or vexatious. There's a similar provision in the Planning and Development Act. The EPA has to decide, make a decision on the matter, must notify the person, uh, giving the reasons uh, why uh, it is not or is, or is not taking action, uh, and inv invite a person that they're entitled to challenge uh, um, uh, that decision, but uh, if there, there's no right of appeal, if you are going to challenge it, you have to challenge it by way of judicial review. Now, the operation of that procedure is obviously is something that one can envisage maybe the source of some contention and indeed maybe the source of some litigation. But again, the fact that you have now have a right to request the EPA to take action and you have a statutory right for them, uh, ob obliging them to consider that and come back to you with a yay or a nay answer uh, is in itself a significant step forward in terms of, of, of what has gone before. Um, the other issue I think that's interesting is... Uh, the issue of the liability for pre prevention and remediation costs. The regulations again adopt and um, include what the directive has said and introduce if you cause uh, environmental damage, you're liable for the costs incurred in carrying out the preventive uh, or remedial measures required in respect of the imminent threat or damage. So you're, you are liable for those costs, and the EPA is entitled to recover its costs as a simple contract debt, which it already has. Um, that's a significant enough change, but um, in any event, existing legislation to a certain degree encompasses, I think, not just the rights to the cost of the action, but also usually allows the recovery of, of, uh, of um, uh, other costs associated with the prosecution. And in certain circumstances, uh, it, this is generally uh, significant, I think, in cases of, uh, um, for example, you can have orders directing people to clean up uh, a particular water pollution instance, and you know, also under the Waste Management Act you can get orders requiring them to remediate the site, and indeed under the Planning and Development Act you can require them at their cost obviously to completely restore the site. So to a certain degree, I'm not sure how, how big a step forward that is, but it, it, it is significant. There's a defence to the operator to prove that the damage was caused effectively by a third party, or if you're com complying effectively with a, um, uh, an order of a public authority.
Um, the interesting there is the definition of costs, to take a look at the definition of costs. Um, and the point there is, is that the definition of costs is very wide, and um, that may have significance itself in that it may be wider than the, the kind of normal concept of costs as you might associate them uh, under existing legislation. So th that could be something that may uh, mean that possibly under the environmental liability regulations there's a wider sc scope to cover a wider range of costs. Um, as a general proposition, uh, it seems that the environmental uh, liability regulations are non-retrospective um, uh, effectively. Um, and there's also a five-year limit in terms of cost recovery uh, applications. Um, I'm conscious of the time just to move on. In terms of offences as well, you've uh, 3,000 uh, six months of imprisonment, 5,000 three years, they're fairly standard. There is a defence uh, of reasonable steps. Okay, if any of the offences under the regulation, there is an offence of reasonable steps, and I think that provision itself will be obviously relied upon by people who are perhaps prosecuted under uh, these regulations. Um, so, the, just to draw some conclusions here. Um, it's a cautious transposition of the Environmental Liability Directive. Um, now, I'm not particularly a fan of the Environmental Liability Directive because I think it was far too ambitious a measure. Uh, I think to try and harmonise environmental liability regimes across Europe is simply too ambitious. Uh, so I think that all that you've got is a fairly minimalist thing. And we have to accept that in many cases, Irish environmental law uh, already met the requirements of the Directive existing environmental law. Having said that, there is no question but that the these new regulations do introduce uh, what I've termed not a radical change but a significant change to the existing regime in environmental liability and they will impose additional burdens on industry and it's important that clients are aware of that and I think the single thing is important that clients are aware of their obligations in terms of imminent threats of environmental damage because that is a significant new thing and an important uh, obligation imposed by the regulations in practice. The second important big change uh, is the provisions in respect of NGOs and the rights given to NGOs uh, and uh, people with a relative interest to request action from the EPA and this really is, is quite a novel provision in Irish law. It's a new idea and how it's going to work out in practice it'll be very interesting to see. I think it's a step forward. Um, I do uh, say one interesting thing here and um, uh, Jonathan may have some uh, illumination to give us on this. An interesting question is to what extent is this going to impose an additional burden on the EPA and to what extent will they have the resources to meet all of these uh, requests for, uh, presumably which one can anticipate, requests for action if they come through, because it's all very well to impose a um, statutory provision entitling something, but you have to resource the particular body to make sure that it has the powers to do it. So I conclude really on that note. Um, I know my colleague is going to follow on and go in in more detail to another area which I think could be very significant as well in the area of contaminated land. But uh, as I say, I'll just conclude on that. That's just to give you an overview of it uh, in, in relation to it. Okay. Thank you.